There'll be a, some, Dr. Spitzano is going to introduce our speaker, who's an old friend of hers, as she'll tell you, I'm sure. Um, so we'll, the story goes, we'll go around, um, you know, for as long as the lecture. I, I would think that we, were gonna, we would end sometime a little after four, maybe 10 minutes after four. There'll be a uh, reception. Is it in the great room? Yeah, it's in the great room. Um, so when you're thinking of leaving, just say, no, it's going to end pretty soon. So um, you'll like the talk and then listen to the questions afterwards and maybe come and have uh, a little bit of whatever we serve, at the, uh, which will be good. You'll like it, I promise. All right. <laughs> no, it's good. Now you want to go? I'm telling you, it's good. All right. All right. So uh, our speaker today will be in introduced by uh, Dr. Spitzano. And so without further ado, here we go. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, well, Dr. Dennis McNamara. Just press the thing. Can, huh? Can you oh. push the slide back? Oh, please? sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm already causing trouble here, um, is, you're going to have to fix this yourself, Dennis. Uh, thank you. Wrong way. There you go. Dr. Dennis McNamara is my oldest friend. We've known each other for 30 years. Um, and in that time, he has remained unchanged in at least two things besides his boyish grin. Um, one is his devotion to his faith, and the other is his love of sacred architecture, um, so the, the study of the architecture of churches. Um, he holds a bachelor's uh, degree in the history of art from Yale and a PhD in architectural history from the University of Virginia. Uh, for 20 years, he was assistant director and faculty member at the Liturgical Institute of the University of St. Mary of the Lake um, in Mundelein, Illinois. Uh, where he taught courses in liturgy and sacramental aesthetics. Um, he is the author of numerous articles on art, architecture, theology, and culture, and has also published three books. Um, one, How to Read Churches, uh, kind of a primer, uh, giving you... Uh, the uh, basics of reading church architecture. This beautiful book, which is my favorite, um, Catholic Church Architecture and the Spirit of the Liturgy. And finally, Heavenly City, the Architectural Tradition of Catholic Chicago. And we'll put these books down here in the front. You can look through them after the talk um, if you're interested. He um, currently has just recently accepted a job and is currently uh, prof associate professor and executive director of the Center for Beauty and Culture at Benedictine College in Kansas. Um, so let's welcome Dr. Dennis McNamara. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Spisano. I've always tell her she's my oldest friend because she's like a month older than I am. So we always make a, make a point out of that. I'm very happy uh, to be here and very happy to be in this building too. The last time I visited this campus, this building was under construction and it's nice to come here and see it. And it's actually part of the discussion um, that we'll have today. You know, the, the justification for traditional architecture in the world today tends to fall in the I like it category. It reminds me of the old days. It looks better. It sells to students. It looks good in the brochures. You know, students taking campus tours like to stay and, you know, look at old looking buildings. And so when you see something like this brand new cathedral, this is not yet a year old, the cathedral in Knoxville, uh, Tennessee, using classical architecture, there's a whole lot of ideas that swirl around out there. Oh, that's backward looking, that's not of our time. Or, oh, that finally looks like a church and that's what a Catholic church should look like. And people have all these kinds of emotional attachments to these things. There are other buildings out there. This, this building, uh, the new chapel at Hillsdale College is I think not even a month old yet, by like Duncan Stroick. And uh, quite an amazing combination of brick and steel and limestone and different colored marbles. And so we're kind of in the, in the midst of a huge revival of traditional architecture in the Catholic world right now. But it goes back a little bit. The Our Lady of Walsingham Church, now the cathedral for the, um, what they used to call the Anglican use of the Catholic, um, right, is uh, from 1999. It's a long time ago. You made people in this room not even born yet. And even older, in 1994, was this church uh, that was eventually built in 
New Jersey by Alan Greenberg, who's one of the leading classical architects of the 20th century. And so part of what my job has been is to not just say, well, I like this, or this makes me feel good, but can we develop a rationale for traditional architecture, what it's about, where does it come from, and especially if it's going to be used in the Catholic Church, is it merely, I remember the 50s and everything was perfect. Anybody who was there in the 50s will tell you it often wasn't perfect. Or some other kind of thing, well, we have to make architecture look like our day, and therefore this is not something relevant to uh, an internet culture. There's a professor at um, Yale for many years, uh, George Hersey, who wrote this little provocative book in the 1980s called The Lost Meaning of Classical Architecture. And basically, he wanted to say, what do all these things mean? You look at a column and it has all these funny moldings and parts and things, and he, and he pro proposed this very provocative question. Why do we still use the classical orders? That means the different kinds of columns, Doric, Hanna, Corinthian. Why, from the Pantheon in Paris to the Capitol in Washington, even to Tokyo and places that had no connection until more recently with the Greco-Roman order, why are these still being used by fascists, Beaux-Arts, neoclassicism, Baroque, revival? And so he wanted to start to answer these questions, and I, that's what I want to do a little bit uh, today. If you're interested in classical architecture, it's, like, it's a little read. It's only about 90 pages. It's about nine bucks on Amazon, and it's full of all kinds of interesting ideas. So the classical inheritance, and you know, here we are in the Humanities Forum, right? So I want to talk something about the, the Western tradition, has uh, an interesting heritage in relation to Christianity, because Christianity is born into the Roman Empire. And I remember watching all of those lecture, the, um, the Easter specials when I was a kid, and you, you'd think they're all walking around in rags in uh, dusty city streets and living in huts in the area around Jerusalem. But you have to remember, Jerusalem was part of the Roman Empire, and there was very serious architecture. If you were an early Christian thinker, you might say, man, God was good because the Romans gave us rhetoric, so you could invent, you know, immediately start using that tradition for preaching. Also in architecture, rhetorical devices in architecture are very common. Ornamental painting, building types that are useful for Christian worship, we'll talk about those a little bit. Mosaic and sculpture and architecture, things like goldsmithing, roads, organization, the military, so people could walk through those roads and bring the Christian faith around. So to say, well, Christianity is just accidentally born into the Roman Empire, I think is a little simplistic. I think if you think providentially in a place like Providence College, you can say, okay, well, here's the great Villa of the Mysteries from Pompeii, which was a, a whole fresco cycle about participation in the initi initiation rites, they think, of a Dionysian uh, religious experience. Doesn't take too much to translate that into a Catholic vision of uh, initiation into a Catholic experience. You can also get to the catacombs in Rome from the fourth century. You know, I don't know if you've been following the Amazon Synod and the Pachamama controversy and enculturation and all that kind of stuff. Well, here early Christians are using Hercules um, triumphing over the Hydra as an example of Christ uh, as a victory, uh, victor over Satan. And so they're bringing their cultural things uh, right into it. Oftentimes you see peacocks at this time. That was an ancient belief that they were like birds of heaven because their feathers looked like gems and that the thought was that their flesh did not decay after they died, so they're a bird of eternal life. Not specifically in the Christian tradition, but brought right in from the Roman culture. And then you have things like portraits that were done when people would die. They put these over their uh, faces in their, in their caskets. And this pretty quickly became a way that images could be brought of not the dead who are about to be buried, but the dead who are still with us as members of the mystical body uh, in heaven. And some people argue that the iconic tradition in the Eastern Church in particular comes out of this understanding. Even things like this, uh, Skyphos is a two-handled wine cup. And they, sometimes they're covered in gold, sometimes they have gems on them, come out of the Greek uh, culture and the Roman culture. You can see how quickly that can become a colleague. And a colleague can be a cup or a colleague can be a chalice. Either way, they come from somewhere and get brought right into the Christian tradition. Something like um, jewelry could easily be transformed to, into uh, a liturgical uh, vessel. And so what do we have? Architecture where suddenly you have big open spaces where a lot of people could fit, which really didn't have until the Roman Empire, uh, until around the time of Christ. This is the Basilica Ulpia in a, in a computer reconstruction. And so if you look at the extent of the Roman Empire, here's Judea and Jerusalem. It's part of the Roman Empire. And you know, Herod's often held up as the bad guy because he kills the innocents, and he's, he's, he's not nice in a lot of ways. He's trying to hold power in, uh, between the Jews and the Romans. He's kind of a Roman-Jewish hybrid, and then the Christianity becomes a Roman-Jewish hybrid in many ways, too. So when you look at some of the things that were built in his time, this is a big model of the Temple Mount in the time of Christ. So the Temple of Solomon in its various 
rebirths is the third one or the second one, depending how you, how you count them, is right there. This is a big open courtyard. These columns here, there were 256 of them, were 30 feet high each, and they were single pieces of stone. And people would come to Jerusalem and they said there was nothing that compared in the Roman Empire other than Rome itself. And in fact, they often thought that the buildings in Jerusalem were even better and nicer and grander than the ones in, in Rome. This is a big outdoor model that's at the Jerusalem uh, State Museum. The mo model itself is 10,000 square feet. It's a big, big uh, model. And they're trying to show what Jerusalem might have been like in the time of Christ. And when you get close to the model, and it's a little hard to know exactly what these buildings might have looked like. There are different gates that are mentioned in scripture. The beautiful gate here, this is the Nicanor Gate. And then different kinds of columns here, Corinthian columns uh, running along there. So imagine Christ being 14 and talking to the doctors, right? That's the, and they can't find him. He's probably sitting around in the hall of a bunch of Corinthian columns made of Jerusalem limestone. He's not in a hut somewhere on a dusty road without ar developed architectural uh, culture. And on um, the one end of the Temple Mount is this thing called the Royal Stoa, which for all intents and purposes looks a whole lot like an early uh, Christian basilica that would be built after Constantine becomes emperor. And here's another uh, detail of it. Here's somebody's uh, reconstruction of what it might look like in section. These are people down here. And Josephus' description of this is that the columns were so big, it took three men around to get around it. So imagine you had two of your best friends with you around a tree hand to hand. That's how big each one of these uh, columns was. And for all intents and purposes, it's basically a basilican church. So, you know, there's a lot of um, polemic around the, the apostles broke bread in their homes and the liturgy is a domestic celebration. Uh, as, that's particularly in post-Reformation uh, Christianity. But you kind of have to imagine Christ and the apostles walking around in very developed uh, classical architecture in the time of Christ. And you can imagine Christ himself uh, being here. There's a little bit left of one piece. They just found one of these leaves from the Corinthian capital, uh, dug it up recently in 2010, to show you it's a pretty convincing uh, bit of Roman architecture. So the, the question for us is, what do we make of this? Here's one of the columns that's in Jerusalem. So these big columns that are running across here, you see this crack in it. If you go to the Jerusalem, the new part of Jerusalem, you're just walking up the main road, and there's a McDonald's and a bank and a, and a dry cleaner, and a column that fell off the cart in the time of building the Temple of Solomon. And uh, they fell off the cart and cracked, so they think they just left it there, and then eventually they just ignored it, and it was discovered in the 1870s. Here's a big monolithic, one piece of stone, a column, and they would have had to have hundreds of those uh, erected. And even the synagogue in Capernaum, which is you know, a bit later than Christ's time, uh, was not a simple neutral meeting house. This was not your Knights of Columbus Hall. Uh, this was a serious building. And the, the Jews and the Romans had an uneasy relationship, as you probably know. Uh, but when they were building their architecture, you can see things like Corinthian columns here with a little menorah in it, or these classical moldings with the Star of David and other symbols that recall uh, the, the, uh, the temple. Now, outside of the Jewish world, you have this other Greco-Roman understanding of architecture, uh, particularly from a fellow named Vitruvius, who's the writer of the only treatise that still exists on architecture from the ancient world. There are others that have been mentioned, but Vitruvius's De Architectura, or as it's translated, usually 10 books on architecture, right at the beginning, in the first chapter, he says, as the human body yields a circular outline, so a square figure may be found from it. You probably know uh, this image uh, went on a space capsule out uh, past Pluto, I think. So the idea is that if aliens ever saw this, they would know that we have four arms and four legs and would understand what humanity is all about. But look what he's saying here. If you measure yourself from fingertip to fingertip, it should be about the same as from head to toe. So I tell people if you're having a party and it's not going well, you know, bring out the tape measure and see if this works with, uh, with your guests. But what's he saying? There's a geometry of what we would call natural theology, the square and the circle being the image of uh, God as no beginning and no end. And so you have a Jewish culture, deeply classical. You have a Greco-Roman culture, deeply classical. And you have columns and buildings that are based on the proportions of the human body coming out of the pagan world. And then, of course, the, the Jewish tradition of human beings being created in the image of God. So what do we have here? We have humans. We have natural theology. We have a biblical culture. We have developed Greco-Roman customs and philosophy and theology and mathematics and notions of justice and beauty. And you can see when you get your squares and your circles here together, they start becoming organizing principles for things like church facades. This is uh, Santa Maria Novella in Florence, one of the early monuments of the Italian Renaissance. We see it fits in a square, and then the square is divided in two, but then it's divided in four. And so you have these notions of the, the 
basic geometry of the human body, which reveals the mind of God to the world, is um, coming from the ancient world, revived in the Renaissance, and in many ways uh, still with us. So the question is, all right, what does that have to do with us, right? Because this is a long time ago, and we're in the 21st century, and we have steel and electricity and internet and all that kind of stuff. There's a fellow um, recently retired from Notre Dame named Bill Westfall, William Carroll Westfall, wrote a very provocative and interesting book called Architectural Principles in the Age of Historicism. And he makes the point that in traditional architecture, there are two things that are used in embellishment. One is uh, decoration and one is ornament, and that these are actually necessary for a building to be beautiful, which is a poke in the eye to the whole modernist world of architecture. I don't know if you think about architecture as a philosophical thing in, you know, in built form, but if you make your building look like a machine, you're making a claim about the role of the machine in modernity. If you make your building look like an ancient building, you're making a claim uh, there. And so he says argument and uh, ornament and decoration are both necessary. And so here's uh, decoration. This is quote right up there clarifies stability by glossing the rules of structure. In other words, it's an enrichment of architecture that clarifies the structural systems at work. So if you think about how nature works, you have poles that are verticals and you have beams that are horizontals, and that's how the world works. Verticals hold up horizontals. Occasionally you have diagonals, but not too often in architecture. And so here's your vertical, here's your big horizontal beam, and then there's your vertical again. And the argument that he makes and that what classical architecture does is it transitions gracefully from vertical to horizontal by having curves and things that suggest compression and release. And that this is very much like ballet is in architecture. It's not the, the 400 pound Olympic weightlifter, you know, grunting with the weight over his head and the veins bulging out of his neck that throws it on the floor. This is the ballet dancer who's on one foot and he's got a woman over his head on one hand and it makes it look elegant and, and beautiful and effortless. And so that what this clarification of structure does takes the everyday function of architecture and, and elevates it into poetic representation. So, you know, I, when I was a kid, I used to watch the reruns of Gilligan's Island. Is this still on, like, me TV or Nick and Knight or anything? Anybody know this? Anyway, whether it's Lost or whether it's your tiki party or whatever you're doing, you have this basic logic of structure, verticals, horizontals, and then the, the screen here, the woven mat is not structural, but it's more, uh, keeps the weather out, right? It's an enclosure, but it's not structural. And so decoration tends to work that way. Different theoreticians over the centuries have tried to come up with the idea of where classical architecture came from. And the structural origin is one of them, that trees were the first uh, columns, and then they became the first posts. And then where the beams uh, stuck out became this enrichment up there. And as it gets more and more sophisticated, you can start to see that there's a structural logic in nature that gets elevated. So, you know, if I could build myself a little hut like that, I'd be pretty pleased with myself, actually. If I had more time and more money and I built my little you know, vacation cabin, I might clarify those logs and smooth them out and I would tie ropes around here. Or maybe if I had a lot of time, I'd use two different color ropes and I'd weave them into patterns. And you can see the logic of structure becomes elevated to, to be more graceful and more poetic. And then eventually you get to things like this. Still has the basic logic of vertical, horizontal, and things that span, but now they have acquired meanings over many centuries. But the logic of decoration or structural clarity in an elevated way is uh, still there. If you see buildings that don't do this, oftentimes people have a reaction to them. This is where I used to live at Mundelein Seminary. That was my room where I, where I lived right there. But see the basic logic of vertical, horizontal, and then beams that span, and if that Sorry, if that beam spans, it has to land on something, and so there's a column over there that carries that weight down uh, to the ground. Sometimes beams stick out at the end of a roof. This is a little garage uh, where I used to live, and the, you can see the pickup truck there. The good old boys used to drink beer and fix trucks there every Saturday night. You could always be sure they'd be there. And so they built this little garage, which is pretty nice. But you see, the beams are not exactly perfect. It's sort of like a mouthful of crooked teeth. And so the question is, how do you make those teeth straight? Well, as the buildings become more sophisticated, the little beams come out and they become regular. And eventually, they become what are known as modillions, which are these little ornamental, uh, actually decorative items that represent the ends of the roof beams coming down. They're not literally the ends of the roof beams, but imagine you had beams coming down, you'd see them. And this is the poetic representation of structure that actually tells you how the physics and the materiality of this building actually works. This is in the tough weather of Chicago. You see this one broke off in the winter, and this one broke off in the winter as well. Uh, so you, know, you can think of this numerically or musically if you want. You know, if these are quarter notes, it's da, 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 rest, da, 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 right? So you start to say, 
instead of a bunch of crooked teeth or a bunch of random notes, you know, banging your fist on a piano, how can you give rhythm to a building that is still structurally logical, even though it's poetic and not uh, literal? And poetic is sometimes hard for people to figure out because they think if it's not literal, you're lying to me. I want the truth. I don't want some poetic representation. So they think like technical writers. But I, I ask people to consider, you know, if, um, if you're, you're dating somebody and then, you know, you, they, you ask them to marry you and they say yes and you go home and write a love letter. Oh, darling, when you said yes to me, I was a gazelle leaping across the stars and there were diamonds in your eyes and roses in your lips. You're not a gazelle and you're not leaping across the stars. And if there's diamonds in your eyes, it's like off to the emergency room, right, because that's a problem. So poetic things distort the facts to make the truth more evident. This is a mind, yeah, write that down if you want. I, see, I saw some people pick up their pens. Poetic things distort the facts to make the truth more evident. These are not literally the ends of beams, but they are telling you that something structural is at work in that. And this is one of the things that decoration does in classical architecture. Sometimes they get quite developed if the ends of the beams are not that nice to look at. They put these little things across them called triglyphs, and we'll talk more about those. You can also see these little scrolls called volutes. They're like bookends. If this book wants to fall over, this keeps it pushed back in. But if it lands on this beam, then this holds it up there, then it supports that, and this supports that, and this supports that. Everything has a logic of structure, but it's in a, in a poetic representation. So this is what decoration is all about. I found this picture yesterday. I figure you know what this, what's this building called? Harkins? Harkins. You know what it looks like now. Maybe you didn't see it under construction. But next time you look there, it's mostly brick, but look where the stone shows up in all the structurally and necessary places where this vertical beam starts to turn to a horizontal arch, and then the, the keystones show up where the structural forces are greater because that's taking all the downward weight and then it has to come around that way. And so there is decoration and even these little stripes here, strengthening the center and all this complex stuff in a building, and this is part of what makes traditional architecture traditional architecture. If this is a glass box, it's all glass. Right? It doesn't show you the logic of structure. It's all just screwed onto the outside of the steel frame. Even this building that we're in right now, uh, sort of revival of this kind of architecture, does the same thing. The strong things appear to be made of stone because they have to carry all this weight when there's a big hole in the ground, and this is signifying where the floors and the ceilings are, and then anything that transfers weight around glass, which has no structural strength, uh, it has the material there that indicates it's strong enough to do what it needs to do to have a hole in the wall, essentially. And so this is the clarification of structure, and it lets you know how a building works. It's one of the constituent elements of traditional design. Little beams like this are called dentals, be precisely because they look like teeth, uh, but they're the little tiny beams that you might see in the, the lath and plaster of an, of an old building. And it's not just a Western convention, by the way. You see it all over the place. In the Eastern tradition, very clear in the structural logic, the great horizontal of the ground transitions to the vertical and that transitions to horizontal again and then is released at the top of the roof. Believe it or not, there's a, a book reprinted from 1926 called A Theory of Moldings. And being an architecture nerd of the highest order, I ordered it instantly. Uh, but there's a whole book on what moldings do, can you believe it? But they all have different kinds of things that they do according to where they are. A crowning molding, you could imagine, up at the top by the ceiling, and it would, it would bring the wall up to the horizontal of the ceiling. Something that's supporting, like a bookshelf, looks like that. Something that's binding would mean like a rope that's tied around it. Or a prone would mean like feet, so that would be at the bottom. You never put this kind of molding at the top, and you don't put this in a place where it doesn't support. And so there's a very rigorous kind of uh, logic to how moldings work that comes out of the logic of structure. And so when you look at the bottom of a column, all these things have names. This is one of those binding moldings here called a torus. But you see how it gradually transitions from the horizontal, sorry, of the ground to the vertical of the column. Same thing happens at the top when it goes from the vertical of the, of the column to the horizontal of the beam. If it just plows into the ground, it's a pole. You see poles in the basements and back porches and stuff. If it gradually transitions from horizontal to vertical to horizontal again, then you know you're doing the ballet-like work of decoration. You can think about your own feet. You know, if you had to walk around on your ankles, it'd be very abrupt. But because your feet come down like this and they're sort of springy, you can sort of bounce around on your feet. And columns do the same thing because they have those molding steps. And then the, the top of a column called the capital is composed of nine squares. And there's a whole lot of overlay of geometry, number, harmony uh, in all these parts as they've been developed over the years. Sometimes um, things across the top of a window have to look logical. You can see these uh, bricks are wider at the top than they are at the bottom, so are these stones, because otherwise they'd fall right through. 
This is called a jack arch or a flat arch. If you don't do that, you can imagine uh, what would happen. If though, there's a steel plate holding that up. But if there weren't a steel plate holding that up and you put your head out there to wave hi to your friends, you know, the, it's called the guillotine um, lintel for a reason because it looks like it could come right down on your head. This is legitimate, believable classical architecture even in new buildings. This is what cheap um, people do. You know, they're just trying to get a strip mall built and they want to do something that they think looks uh, traditional. They don't understand how decoration actually works. Simple as this, verticals, horizontals, beams, diagonals, and tied together. And then it can be more elaborate. These are all uh, pieces that came out of a, an architectural supply catalog for a new seminary in Nebraska about 10 years ago, but representing the ends of the beams, the column, and then the beam that goes like that. So you're getting the idea, I guess, of what decoration is. Simple to complex, it doesn't always mean you have to spend lots of money, it just means that it does what nature does in architecture. Simple as this in a, the new uh, library in Nashville. Or as simple as this, column sports beam, beam sports arch, and it lands on the one on the other side. It'd be more complicated like this, but it's still the ba same basic logic, verticals, horizontals, and everything. Notice where the seams are. That seam is right there, and that seam is right there, centered on the column because that's the strongest part. You wouldn't put the seam there because it doesn't make any sense uh, logically. And it could be quite grand, great Paris uh, churches, or it can be quite uh, less grand. There's the basic logic of structure. Now, we're right next door to this building. If your structural logic is ambiguous and confusing, you can say it's not well decorated, right? Now, we think decoration means I bought a bunch of stuff at the store, you know, hang them around my room. What we're talking about is a big, heavy-looking, concrete thing floating on a plane of glass, structurally illogical, possible because of steel and concrete and all the modern um, technological uh, engineering things we have, but it doesn't look logical to us when you walk by. Why is this big, heavy thing floating over my head and these walls that look so thin don't appear to be doing what it needs to be doing? You can imagine putting a beam across there and a row of columns there, and then you can relax when you walk in there and know it's not gonna fall on your head. Now we know it's not gonna fall on our head because it doesn't fall on our head, but it doesn't look like it's not gonna fall on our head. And so one of the things about traditional architecture in the broad sense is it's believable structural logic that grows out of the nature of things. This is how the classical worldview uh, thinks. So here's a little summary of decoration. It makes the natural physical forces of the world more evident and then raised into the nature of things as they could appear in a restored world. So here's a ballet dancer, very unnatural movement. You could almost say it's supernatural movement. It's defying gravity in a, in a way and bringing us to a condition, a heavenly looking condition. This is the top of the baldacchino at the new chapel in Thomas Aquinas College in California. Notice that cross on that ball is doing the same thing as that ballerina's feet. It's up high, it's easy, it's defying gravity, it's transferring that weight easily, not just clumping together like people wearing army boots uh, around. And so when you start thinking about architecture that's Catholic, that anticipates the future of heaven, decoration isn't just this kind of fussy old stuff that people like me talk about. You're talking about reaching into the heavenly future and bringing it into our own time. There's other kind of enrichment in architecture, though, and this is what's called ornament, at least in this system. Here's how Bill Westfall defines it. An enrichment that explains and clarifies function and purpose. Uh, it contributes to legibility, and it also indicates festivity. If you know how to read this thing, you probably can tell me a lot about it, right? This is the three Bs, the coat of arms is the Barberini family, one of the great papal families in Rome. And you know they're a pope because they have the papal tiara and the keys over there. And then these ropes are hanging and tassels are tasseling. And it's just doing what these things do to indicate something about the nature of uh, the building and its use. There's all kinds of ornaments. This is uh, McDonald's in Rome which they don't like McDonald's in Rome for a whole lot of reasons, but imagine if it didn't say McDonald's, all you had to see was that, and you would know exactly what they were getting inside there. That little bit of ornament that's not supporting the building, but in fact supported by the building, tells you use, purpose, and sometimes festivity, uh, and you'll see that in a second. So here's your uh, building again that we're in right now, and here is the coat of arms of the province, St. Joseph's province, and I think that's the larger Dominican order over there. Completely unnecessary for the structure of this building, right? It does not rely on this the way it relies on columns or arches. In fact, if that were a real shield, it would be you know, up there with a nail and a hammer. Uh, so it's supported by the building, but it tells you about the building. Where are we? Province of St. Joseph. What is the province of St. Joseph part of? The larger Dominican order. So legibility is right at the heart of all sacramental revelation. And so increasing legibility accurately will increase uh, capacity for the thing to reveal itself 
for the viewer. It's pretty straightforward stuff at the end of the day, really. I found this picture on the internet, and I was like, well, that's a little creepy, actually, at first, <laughs> right? The, the scary looking friar coming out of the closet there in the, whatever room this is, uh, coming out of the, of the walls to, to eat you or something. But you, you don't know where this room is. You see the friar, oh, must be Providence College, right? There it is. Uh, and so that ornament is not relying, it's not holding up the building. The building's holding it up, but it tells the person in the room something about where they are. It's like a police officer in a uniform tells you they're a police officer. Uh, maybe I'll give you a little quiz. Anybody can guess where this is? This little bronze plaque? It's in New York. Any, any guesses what part of New York? What building? Radio City Music Hall. Okay, there it is. This is the Rockettes. That one's unhappy for some reason. She's having a bad day. Uh, but you add this little thing to the building, and suddenly you know what it's about. Here's another one. Any guesses on this? This is supposed to be a shield. There's little what are called cartouches, except that it's a turtle and some fish. It's the reptile house at the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. How about this? If your Latin is good, you might be able to figure this out. It's the Mons Beatitudinum, which is the Mount of the Beatitudes. This is the gate into the church, the Mount of the Beatitudes. They took the letters and put them in the shape of a mountain to reinforce the revelation of uh, where it is. Uh, let's see. This is a perpetual adoration chapel uh, in uh, Chicago area. And you can see, if you know how to read it, what's it about? Christ, victory of the cross in the garden of the earth is now present to us in the form of the blessed sacrament. Tells you about the nature of the building. And so it reinforces uh, the, the experience of what the thing is about. This is what ornament does. Here's a gate in a communion rail. Well, what is it? There are those peacocks again, and they're in the garden of the grapes. In other words, anticipating the time when we'll be in the heavenly garden of the new Jerusalem. But it's all um, presented to us through uh, ornament. Ornament is the enemy of modernist architecture a lot of times. They say it's just the holdover of the past age, and in some ways it is. Uh, George Hersey makes the claim that all ornament in the classical world are actually tropes of ritual sacrifice. Now, tropes are turns of phrase. So if you've ever heard in the uh, you know, Jesus, uh, Prince of Peace, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us, that's a trope of Lamb of God. It's a trope. It's a turn of phrase. We get the word trophy from that, by the way. Uh, you know, if you have your little bowling guy at home, uh, that's the thing you took from the other team when the, the, uh, the battle turned. So two armies fight against each other, and then the tide turns, and they take the other army's stuff and bring it home to prove that they won. The word tropane in Greek is a, a turn, gives us the word trope. And so here's one of these um, plaster casts of an ancient Roman temple. Here's the head of the bull that's been sacrificed. Here's the bowl that the priest used to pour the blood. Here's the ax used to chop the animal apart. Here's the knife did the same. That's the whip to get the animal up there. That's the helmet of the priest. Here are the eggs that are often offered as sacrifice at temples uh, because birds were often offered as sacrifice at temples. So he's saying here we have what's left of ritual sacrifice, except it's not literal anymore. It's poetic. So when you see a church in New York City, okay, well, there's the image of uh, St. Andrew who was crucified in the X-shaped cross on a shield carried down by angels. It's the trope of his participation in uh, the sacrifice of Christ tells us who it is. And then there's lots of other things on architecture. The egg and dart is a good one. You may know that. You can still buy egg and dart moldings at Home Depot uh, to this day. The egg here is shown with the shell. This is the shell, and that's the yolk inside. So imagine somebody cut the yolk, opened it up. I mean, cut the shell, opened it up, and let you see the yolk inside. The symbol of new life. This is why rabbits bring chicken eggs at Easter uh, still uh, to this day. But also, you can see it in the Psalms. May the, the sparrows lay her young by your altars. If the birds show up in scripture, unless they're vultures, uh, birds show up in scripture, it's usually good news. Doves show up with olive branches, good news. Uh, mustard seed grows into a great tree, and the birds nest in it, good news. And so eggs were often offered as sacrifices in the ancient world, and there they are in the architecture itself. You can see it's also wearing a necklace. This is called a bead and reel uh, here. And then all sorts of other stuff, all, all there. Here's another necklace. This is from the St. Louis old train station. Uh, egg and dart, and then this building is wearing a great earring in a sense of, uh, of flowers, but in stone rather than uh, literally. This is um, the Pantheon in Paris. You notice they really know their theory of ornament, so it's actually, they have a carved a little ring and a little string and then ribbons, so this appears to be actually hung on the building to enrich the festivity of the building. And then you can see, what do you see here? Leaves, more leaves, this is a necklace, appears to be pearls, more egg and darts up there. And so the building's dressed up because it's doing what uh, they, people do when they're festive. You see this kind of stuff all over the place. Ribbons floating. You know this has something to do with the Pope because the keys and the umbrella. 
Now, I don't have to tell you what's about to happen in that picture on the top left, right? Even if you weren't there that day, which you probably weren't there uh, that day, you know they're about to get married. How come? Because, and I'll introduce you to very complicated sounding ritual theory in the West. If you want to indicate festivity, you hang stuff on stuff. Okay, so that you can write that down too if you want. If you want to indicate, <laughs> I, I see two points floating around the room for everybody here for all the extra credit. If you want to indicate festivity, hang stuff on stuff, right? Doesn't mean hang stuff everywhere, so you can't see what's under the stuff. But these ribbons, or this whatever that tool is going down there, festivity. These little flowers were growing happily in a field, and somebody ripped their little heads off and threw them on the ground. Now, it also involves waste festivity in a sense. Waste, or um, you know, you don't charge people a ten dollar cover charge when you invite them over for Thanksgiving, right? You just give them stuff for nothing. And so festivity involves this. I don't know who these people are at the bottom, but I've been using their picture for a long time. I'm afraid they're going to be at a talk someday and say, hey, that's us. But that's a watermelon uh, wearing a sombrero. It's a little hard to see at first. And then there's, um, there's a honeydew melon in the shape of a swan. This is what we do when we're festive, right? We add stuff and we, we celebrate in this kind of not extreme way, but in, a, in a, a high level of enrichment. You can probably tell which one of these is Martha Stewart, uh, left or right. Well, actually, it says Martha Stewart right there. This is good Connecticut tasteful um, ornament on this side. That's kind of the house everybody, nobody, nobody's home in that house. Everybody's over here looking at this one. Uh, but at Christmas, we hang stuff on stuff. And almost to the point where you can't see the house. And then trim. I mean, this is a store in, um, down in the garment district of uh, New York City. All this stuff you buy to put on yourself to indicate something uh, festive. Think of a bride and all the stuff she puts on herself for her wedding day. If she were to work the next day, she's crazy, right? If she wears that on her wedding day, she's fine. I mean, this is just how we know. When festivity happens, we do this kind of thing. So all kinds of structure and ornament and decoration come together to make a building enriched. Here are those medallions or the end of the beams, but here's a shield and it's tied with a ribbon and then there are swags of fabric coming around like that. And here are more flowers and all sorts of things hanging around in the same architecture. So if you say, well, I like old stuff, that's not an intellectually rigorous way to enrich a building. Here's a light, I and mean, this is a light in a chapel. It's a pretty nice uh, light. You could probably write a two-page paper on that lamp just by itself. What's it about? Why are these lamps plants? Why are they wearing earrings? Why is it made of crystal? Why is this the same thing as the Roman standard that the Roman army would have carried around to show the ICX or the victory of Christ and the Roman emperor and Christ being the new emperor and all this sort of stuff and then ribbons and bows and swags. This is a, this is a festive light for a festive occasion which is the coming together, the wedding of God and man in the liturgy. And you see it in other buildings, too. This one's got flowers here and the egg and dart uh, in the middle. So if task lighting, look up here, task lighting. There you see it's, it's pretty handy to have it when you need it. But if you want your lamp to be celebrating in a heavenly way, you probably want it to do something more like that. Now I'll get back to the triglyph. That's this little thing here, this little block with three lines. Nobody knows exactly where this comes from, but George Hersey, who I mentioned before, had a theory. So why on earth were these things here at all? And he looked up the word triglyph and found that tri means three, and a glyph means a line, like a hieroglyph. But also in Greek, uh, at least he claims, it means a thing that has been chopped. A glyph is another definition, is a thing that has been chopped. So he's like, what's been chopped? And he looked at some of the descriptions of the ancient Greek ritual, and they knew they would take the sacrificial animal up there, and certain parts of the animal were considered more sacred than others. So the head was one, uh, and you can see how they would have the record of the sacrifice of the animal uh, with its head right there. Um, in the stone of the building. The other part was the thigh bone because it was so big, it had so much marrow in it, that they would actually cut it into three parts, tie it together with a tendon, wrap it in fat, and then stick it up on the building at the end of these beams that were not nice to look at. And so his argument is that this triglyph is actually three pieces of a bull's femur. This molding to this day is still called a tania, which is the Greek word for tendon, and this is the little drops of the marrow and blood dripping out of the animal's bones. It's too bad we didn't do this yesterday. It's a good Halloween story, better than All Saints story. But if you're a Christian, you're like, what is this pagan worship have to do with a Christian church? Why on earth would we use this? Well, they stopped putting the literal bones on the building and started carving them in stone. And what became a bloody record of the sacrifice of a victim offered on behalf of the people by a priest to the God became an unbloody record of the sacrifice offered by a priest on behalf of the people to the God, which you know I just described the Eucharist, right? The unbloody representation of the sacrifice. So this is how enculturation works when it comes into the Christian world. It's like, wow, 
the Romans gave us something that's just one more drop of, of knowledge, and it's perfectly acceptable in uh, Catholic architecture. And so here we have this tropes of ritual sacrifice that come right into our world. And in fact, one of the kind of theoretical experiments of this was in Rome. This is a little chapel built on the site where St. Peter was thought to have been martyred, uh, called San Pietro in Montorio. Here's the triglyphs, and then in between are not pieces of bulls, but these are the cruets uh, from mass, water and wine. Here's the missal, here's the pectoral cross of the bishop. So in other words, the new sacrifice of the mass has been, uh, has superseded the old sacrifice, but it doesn't undo the classical tradition that, that was inherited. So, uh, let's see, we'll, we'll kind of scroll through here just for the sake of time and get to uh, something like this. The Westminster Cathedral, very clear. What's ornament, what's decoration? Decoration, the column holding up the beams. Ornament, images of the saints tied to the columns, uh, theoretically in stone uh, with ribbons. And together, they make a building that's delightful to look at, not just because the uh, ornament book you know, exploded all over the building, but because there's a real logic. How is it held up? How do we imitate the processes of nature, elevate them? And then how do we make the building reveal what it is uh, with the ornament? Now, the last of these is, um, well, if you want to ever do an architectural lexio, which I recommend, this prayerful study of scripture, look up the word pillar, look up the word ornament, and you'll find that ornaments in scripture are a convention that mark right relationship with God. When people are happy with God, they wear ornaments, their cheeks, as it says, are with strings of jewels. When they worship the golden calf, God says, take off your ornaments and go put on sackcloth and ashes. So when you think too much of yourself, go hang around in the dirt, the dust, where you came from. And when you're in right relationship with God, he wants to bless you. And so there's many, many, many examples where the word ornament shows up in scripture as a sign of friendship with God. Now the column, it's the last one. There's a long history of the column. Column is way more than a pole, by the way. Uh, you see them in scripture as early as Exodus. Moses meets the Lord, and then he sets up 12 columns that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the two hollow bronze columns in front of the temple in Solomon, uh, Solomon had names. They were given people's names, Jacking and Boaz. And then it shows up again and again in different places. Now, one of the mystery, interesting things about the hollow bronze columns in front of the Temple of Solomon is that there were hollow bronze columns put over the altar at St. Peter's. Get that to work. There you go. So here they are. It's kind of an interesting departure from the usual Roman method of using marble columns. Well, here's your little, uh, here's your little quiz. Can you fill in the blank? Jesus, son of blank, have pity on me. What goes in the blank? Anyone know? Say, yeah, I heard it. Say it loud. David. Who's the son of David? Who's, the, who's the, David's actual son? Solomon. What did Solomon do? Builds the temple of Solomon, right? What did Christ do? He builds the new temple of his body. Who is in charge of that until the second coming? Peter and the successors of Peter, right? So to say, I'm using the same columns as Solomon is not just, oh, I like swirly columns because they're cool. They are kind of cool. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, the swirly columns are called Solomonic columns. They were associated from the early centuries with the Temple of Solomon. And so an art historian will say light and shade, chiaroscuro, baroque, movement, activity, visual activity. But a biblical interpretation can say more than that. I'm going to come over here. You see columns everywhere, uh, but they also are understood in a hierarchy. Maybe you know Tuscan is a simple one. Doric is relatively more elaborate with the triglyphs. Ionic has the scrolly ones. Corinthian is the pretty high status. And then composite has the scrolls and the leaves together. And they were markers of hierarchy. So Tuscan, if you had columns at all, would be on barns and outbuildings. Corinthian on something important. Composite on something really, really important. Can anybody have a guess on what kind of columns are in St. Peter's in Rome? I just gave you the cheat sheet, but you probably weren't looking. So what would your intuition tell you? What columns would be on the, temp the St. Peter's? The most important church in the world. Yeah, go ahead. The Corinthian or the composite, right? The highest status one. Well, take, take a look again. Big, big Corinthians over here. See, that's a guy down there. It's huge, but composite on the Baldacchino, which is over the tomb of Peter, over the altar, because this spot, sorry, this spot is more important than this spot. So this is either the kind of thing that drives you crazy because you say, who cares? Nobody notices why I spend all that money. Or you can be a Thomist and say, I like my divisions and definitions and subchapters and define your terms and everything's just in the right place. And so that's kind of a certain kind of mindset people have. Different kinds of columns represent different kinds of people, by the way. Vitruvius, the ancient writer, tells us that the Ionic column with the scrolly ones for a long series of reasons was the symbolic, symbolic representation of women. 
uh, women who were captured in battle, the wives of the soldiers. The soldiers were killed and the women were taken into slavery. And they were from this town called Carrier and they were known for having these swirly kind of Princess Leia cinnamon bun hairdos in that town. And that became the scrolls of the Ionic column. And so from then on, the Ionic became the column that represented the mother, not only a woman, but a married woman or a mother. And the very first church in the history of the world, in the West church anyway, uh, that was dedicated to Mary was the very first one that used Ionic columns running down the, um, the nave. So don't think of columns as fancy poles. Think of them as people. The top of a column is called a capital. That comes right from the word head. The bottom is called a pedestal, related to the word pes, pes the foot, the pedestrian or a pedal. So think of these as saints that are lined up along here, holding up the roof and on their way processing uh, toward the altar. Sometimes they're bridal columns. She's got a veil in her hair and a flower in her hair there. Sometimes they're, they have the shape of people. Uh, I did get this guy's permission on the right to take that picture. Uh, he's sort of a barrel-tisted guy, and he's got a barrel-tisted column, right? This is my friend Gary from graduate school who's exactly the size of this pier, although he's a little short. Notice his head is, should be up here, right, according to Thomas Jefferson's ideal of, of architecture. But if he were a few inches taller, the capital would be exactly the size of his head. So it's a, you can say it's related to the human body. Right here in scripture, this is the great uh, New Testament image of columns uh, Peter, James, and John are called pillars of the church. And that's a phrase we still have in our, in our life. Sometimes they look like this with uh, columns with people painted on them. This is the church in the nativity in, in Bethlehem. And sometimes uh, they have lots of stories. I don't have time to go all, I, I pack this full of too much stuff. The basic deal with the Corinthian though, which represents the young girl, is that this architect came along and saw a basket on the ground that was put over the tomb of a teenage girl that died. And her parents had put the basket accidentally on the root of a plant that was dormant. And then he comes walking by, sees the plant growing, and says, that looks like a really cool thing. I think I'll put that on the top of my column. And the Corinthian capital was born. But you see, now it's associated with a young girl because she's the one who died. It's associated with death and life because the dormant plant comes back to life. And all of a sudden, a steel I-beam is a whole lot less than a Corinthian column because it doesn't have all those accrued meanings. Um, which, which column type is this? Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, or Corinthian? Are these men, women, mothers, unmarried women, married women? You, you get what I'm saying here. If you, if you lose this inherited tradition, you lose the power of these things to convey that information into our own time. And they come in all kinds of things. The tobacco leaf capitals at the US uh, Capitol is pretty well known that they wanted to have the local uh, flora of the US instead of the ones from the Mediterranean basin. This is from the Supreme Court in um, Washington, D.C. with the American Eagle uh, up in that typical place. Anybody uh, can guess where this one comes from? You got wheat and corn here. Go ahead. Yeah. Agricultural place, it's the Nebraska State Capitol, right? Because they grow a lot of wheat and corn right there. It's a Corinthian column. It's associated with all the things the Corinthian column is associated with, but then it does it in a local way. This is another one from the Lincoln Park Zoo reptile house, by the way. These are snails, water lilies, and, and turtles, and lizards, and all that stuff. So as Corinthian as 400 BC, and as reptile house in Chicago, as reptile house in Chicago ought to be, to be local. This is the Lyric Opera in Chicago, which puts the, the harp uh, right there in the middle of the Capitol. So there's an endless number of ways to do this. This is a Pontiac dealer from the late 20s. So that's the Pontiac logo uh, right there. Obviously thinks their car is important. And this is from the YMCA in Jerusalem, where they have all the capitals based on biblical things. You'll become fishers of men. Other ones have ox and lambs laying, you know, laying down with bears and stuff. Um, so uh, hopefully what you, what you get out of this is that ornament is not this fussy leftover stuff from the olden times because we like old things. Ornament can be invented today and still be the revelation, a revealer, a part of the revealer of the nature of a thing. Decoration takes the nature of structure, clarifies it in the earthly sense, but then raises it to the level of something uh, quite high. And so if you're starting to hang around in a Catholic worldview, okay, the world has fallen, but because we've been redeemed and th through grace, we can actually sacramentalize the heavenly future where everything is perfect. Well, let's make the structure of physics in the world look elegant and easy and like a ballet dancer. Let's take the ornament and put it on things so that people know who we are, what we are, what we're celebrating. And so traditional architecture, in, at least as I see it, intellectually conceived, carefully conceived, is not nostalgia. 
Nostalgia is sometimes good. It comes out of a good instinct. But it's often not enough. I like old stuff is not the same as I have a well-developed theology of the revelation of the world at the end of time when God has restored it all to the glory that it's supposed to have. So I know this is a, a fast talk uh, crash course in a lot of things. Um, but thank you for your attention. I hope you get your, your two points or three points from, from everybody. So thanks. We have a little, little time for questions. questions. Yeah. yeah. So that was great. OK. Wow. That was super fun. Uh, so let's have some, some questions. And we always like to start with uh, students before the faculty hog things. Um, so here we go. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. So I just have a question, which, which could be a digression. Uh, I can repeat it for you if you need to. There you go. So um, do you have any opinion on the reconstruction of Notre Dame mm -hmm. in France? The question on the reconstruction of Notre Dame. All right, well, uh, here's a hornet's nest. Let's stick a, let's poke it with a stick and see what happens, okay? So the, most of the roof, uh, much of the structure was medieval, but the, the flesh, which is the tall midi, um, sort of metal um, spire, was 19th century, right? So they added it in the 19th century, a fellow named Viollet le Duc, who loved the Middle Ages. He loved French Gothic in particular. He studied it inside and out and backwards, and he said, I'm gonna give the cathedral the thing that the medieval people would have given it if they were alive today, right? So he's trying to make it be part of that thing. He wasn't saying, hmm, our age is defined by industry and you know, we're part of the thesis, antithesis, synthesis, Hegelian model of cultural evolution, so if I don't do that, I'm gonna be a, a backward looking person who's not bringing the progress of culture forward. He's just saying, let's give this the best darn steeply thing we can give it as the mind of the medievals would have given it. And so, he was interested ontologically in a sense of what is the nature of Gothic architecture? What does it indicate? How is that an image of the towers of the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly city? Um, and then a lot of the people who are proposing many of the, what I would consider the more absurd proposals now, sometimes they're just people who want to make a name for themselves. You know, the more absurd it is, the more flash in the pan your name gets, then you become the famous architect and then you get lots of jobs and become rich, right? So there, there is that opportunistic moment. But you see those arguments, they're often chronological rather than ontological. So ontos in Greek means being, and ontology is the study of being, and it's quickly related to the nature of things. So I like to think of it this way. What's the nature, theologically, of Notre Dame Cathedral as a sacrament of the heavenly Jerusalem, as a time, as an indicator of the time when the world is unfallen, versus, oh, let's make a glass roof with a swimming pool because we can, right? You know, that you have to say, it's not really an ontological argument, it's not a theological argument. However, copying it exactly as it was in the 19th century, it's pretty safe. But if someone could convince me that they could make something more appropriate, more beautiful, a better revelation of the heavenly Jerusalem, a better bearer of theological realities, I would say, okay, prove it. But if you can, it's all right. It's all right to do that. Uh, so historicists, and historic preservationists, or often historicists, say things have value because they mark a period in history. That's a modern way of thinking, as opposed to this has value because the good, the true, and the beautiful, and that which leads people to God and eternal happiness is better represented than the last one. And that's how people look through mo history, most of the history of the world, until the last couple of centuries. So that's my view. Make it better if you can, but don't make it worse. And if you do make it, make it theological, and based on the ontology of the building, not on an arbitrary foreign philosophy that it has to be relevant to our time, because the building's not really asking for that. Question? Somebody's got to be brave. I can always say more if you want. You want to ask another question? <laughs> go ahead. Uh, first, can you go back to the slide for uh, for our library? For which? Uh, for our oh, library. Oh, for your library? Yes. Here? Okay. I knew I might get in trouble for that. Okay. Let's see if I can find it here. That's all the way back in the decoration section. There you go. Uh, so you may argue that it is not very beautiful in your 
vocabulary or category. Well, but I didn't do that. I oh. would, but I didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but I think this is very suitable for its purpose mm -hmm. because as a library, you should drop all your hope before you come in. <laughs> and uh, so the library should make you feel like you're going to the Yes, gallows, and you need to be a little bit strict to go to there. So I would argue this is a masterpiece. Okay. I like that. I, I like that you're brave. So now the, the worldview that my head hangs around in is what they call the realist or the, the Aristotelian Thomistic worldview about the nature of beauty. Um, there are lots of other ways to think about beauty. But if you do look at that Thomistic system, he says, we call a thing beautiful when it reveals its ontological reality. This comes through Jacques Maritain and others, Umberto Eco, G.B. Fallon, and some others. But if a thing reveals what it is as it's understood in the mind of God, in other words, God has this un insensible, intangible, perfect understanding of the nature of a thing. So, you know, he knows the best version of this little book. And so we try to make one that looks like that. And if I rip this in half and throw the other half away, it's a less good version of that, right? So we say, okay, well, what's the nature of structure? What's the nature of library? Well, is the library really the place where you, you go to be tortured, you know, before final exams? Or is the essential dignity of the library, here's the wisdom of the ages inspired by the Holy Spirit, revealed by the word of God, coming from the mind of God the Father, that we are fortunate enough to have collected in a bunch of books that we have access to, and... I can perfect, have my character perfected by bringing this human effort and knowledge to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that I can look at the face of God for eternity, right? Do you say it does that? Well, okay, right? But see, the crucifixion is a beautiful thing, right? And so the earthly crucifixion is not pretty. Very often you do see crucifixions that are shown in their heavenly eschatological glory. When you read what these architects were saying, now, you can disagree with this, but at least to know what they were saying, they would say, well, we live in an age that's industrial, right? To be true to our age, we have to use industrial materials. But not only do we have to use industrial materials, they have to look, in, the building has to look industrial. So they argued not only for the engineer's knowledge, which is great, there's engineer's knowledge in this building, but that it had to have the engineer's aesthetic as well. And that's a different thing. To look industrial is by definition a different thing than looking eschatological or looking ecclesiastical or looking domestic or whatever it happens to be. And so that's a real hinge point. Now, wherever, whichever side of that hinge you come down on is yours, but that's a very important thing to distinguish, I think. Yes. Well, I, you go to some of the questions. Frank, over here. The Roman basilicas have flat roofs, but we're used in this country to the arched roofs. Was there a theological reason for changing from one to the other? Yeah, you see those arched roofs, especially as building technology advances into the Middle Ages. Of course, the Gothic cathedrals are the usual held up as the great examples. One of the structural reasons for the pointed arch and the taller arch was they're structurally more, they can hold more. The more horizontal a thing is, the more likely it is to sag in the middle. The more round it is, is actually the more flat it is. The more pointed it is, the more vertical it is. And so to carry the weight down more efficiently uh, is something that the Romans had. They had some knowledge of big concrete domes and everything. But by the time of the early Christians, they chose not to use them, which is very interesting. In fact, there's a book by a guy named John O'Nions. It's called Bearers of Meaning. It's this whole history of columns and where they come from and why they're, why they're used and how they're used. Constantine in the fourth century is building this big basilica called the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine, and the columns are barely there. It's all poured concrete. They have these big, voluminous uh, roofs that are arched. And then the same guy builds a church with rows of columns down the side on a flat roof. And he argues that if the theological reaction, rea reality of the column is that it's a person, and a person is a pillar of the church, then you would actually, there was a column revival in the time of Constantine, only in the churches, however, um, and that that was actually a theological move and so to, to distinguish the sort of secular imperial architecture from the Christian Basilican architecture, the columns came back. That's not a justification for why they didn't, why they have you know, straight, what they call trabeated system, a straight beam across. Because um, they had the technology, but for whatever reason, chose not to do it for a thousand years. And that'd be an interesting study to find out, find out why. Thank you so much. I want to ask about ornament in particular. Um, one's a little bit more of a, a narrow question, a scholarly one. I just want to point out that something I remember from reading Thomas Aquinas's version of the Hexameron in 
uh, the 60s there in the Prima Pars is that the word ornament appears or the God uh, ornamenting creation appears a fair amount, that, that verb, if I'm not mistaken. So it seemed to be something that God particularly delighted in when he made things. So I would be interested in if you had any comment on that and any connection of that to what you said. But, um, and my second question, which actually is the one I want to ask even more than that one, was this. Is there a, as, as your lecture grew, I found myself getting more excited uh, as we progressed towards ornament and the words like festivity and legibility. And uh, so uh, Vitruvius sort of wanted to map our structurally architecture onto our bodies. I wonder if there's a way in which we could say that your talk sort of maps onto something about us, a kind of progression from our bodiliness to our spirit uh, in kind of the thrust of our human nature toward these things that of delight, like festivity, legibility. So just to rephrase that briefly, does your talk sort of progress from human bodiliness to the human spirit in some way? Okay, well, I haven't done the, the particular study of Aquinas, as you suggest. Um, what I would say is it seems logically consistent. The thing, about, the thing about ornament, and people use the word ornament and decoration differently. So Bill Westfall uses them this way, and in his book he argues that some people use them the opposite way. Decoration is, or, decoration is clarity of purpose and structure and not structure and so on. Um, but that ornament is a contributing factor to legibility. And legibility is an essential part of sacramental mediation, right? So how do you actually encounter something if it's not presenting itself in an encounterable way at a level of specificity that's high enough that you know what it is? And so biblically, I would say the, the ornament is associated with growth in holiness. Uh, gems are another biblical thing that are very similar. The stone, you know, Paul says you're living stones. The, the stones of the Temple of Solomon were these immense stones that came out of um, David's quarry. And they had to um, consecrate priests to cut them. It's very interesting. You just imagine any priest you know. It's like the first assignment is the quarry. That's not, not good news for him. But the idea was the stone became a symbolic representation of a person. The people, the stones, were assembled into the temple as the mystical body's members were assembled in the temple of Christ's body. But then they're even elevated to the level of gems. And so gems are glorified stones. And so in that sense, they become not only ornamented, things hung on them, but they internally become ornamental versions of themselves, I guess you could say. And so that just seems to be the pattern. When people are in right relationship with God because their soul is right, because they're doing right worship, then they are receiving the laurel wreath, so to speak, of in this spiritual eternal sense. Um, there's the, the one story, I think it's an exodus, of the, the mysterious figure that covered in jewels and admires himself too much, and then God says, take off all your jewels. And it's one of these things that they think might be an evocation of Satan who was delighted in his own beauty and then had to... Um, too much. And so ornament that becomes about ornament is not good. Ornament that clarifies the nature of the thing is good. So that's that Aristotelian mean between excess and deficiency that reveals it more. And your second question was about the moving from the body to the spirit. Is that what it was? Right, yeah, you know, um, there aren't too many treatises from the Middle Ages on architecture, but the two famous ones are by Abbot Suget, De Administrazione and De Consecrazione, and he talks about the, the under his administration, consecrating the church of Saint Denis, and he talks about anagogy quite specifically. He says, when I look at all these beautiful gems and gold and stained glass, he says he's carried off um, to a place somewhere above the slime of the earth, but beneath the purity of heaven. And so it's this place, this sacramental place, where the spirit rises, he says, out of the fallen matter or something like that, and hangs around in this, not quite in heaven yet, so the spirit is exalted and participating in this increased way in the eschatological future by way of anticipation, um, but is not, not completely in the fallen realm either. So it's not losing the fallen world, but hanging out of it in between. And so this strong notion that being led up from things to the eternal prototypes that they sacramentalize is actually part of the job of ornament because it reveals the nature of the thing to the mind and the mind is, has to know what it's perceiving and if it can't, it can't know what it's perceiving unless it's there to be perceived, I guess. It's a little, I mean, it's a little intimidating to talk these kind of terms in front of philosophers and theologians. I'm just an architectural historian, so. We're made for, yeah, delight. Right. <laughs> 
and the wedding language of Scripture, really important, right? If, if God, if Christ is the bridegroom in the church, all of us are the bride and we're separated, uh, you know, the wedding feast of the Lamb is when heaven and earth are fully united again. And what's the thing? The wedding feast of the Lamb has begun. So if liturgy is sacramentalizing that, liturgy by definition is festive, liturgical songs are festive, liturgical architecture is festive, liturgical vessels are festive, liturgical vestments are festive, and festivity is marked by an increase, enrichment, and ornament, not just because we like a lot of stuff, but ornament that reveals the festive nature. And so I'll ask my students, you know, if one veil on a bride is good, wouldn't 17 veils on a bride be better? No, that's 16 veils too many, right? But no veils is deficient, 17 veils is excessive, and then you find the mean uh, in between to get to that level of sacramental mediation. I like the festivity, so I think I'm going to end it on there. And um, this was a great talk. This is exactly the kind of thing we're looking for at the Humanities Forum, and I think it was a good Friday afternoon, so let's give Dr.